153 na kwa wale waliofariki ni 107 mtazamaji Wizara Afya inatoa taarifa uh, ya taswira kamili ya jinsi hali ilivyo kufikia sasa. Apologizing to you for keeping you waiting here. We had planned to be here a little bit earlier. Uh, but uh, we got tied up with a few other things. So our apologies for keeping you waiting. Uh, let me welcome you to this uh, briefing today, this update on coronavirus uh, status in the country. In the last few days, our numbers have noticeably risen. We have observed that these figures have generated a degree of panic and anxiety among Kenyans. This is understandable considering that none of us wants our loved ones to be affected by COVID. The increasing numbers mean that the possibility of one getting infected is real because the virus is well entrenched in our community and is lurking in our midst. Yet, it is possible to curtail the spread of the virus if all of us strictly adhere to the containment measures. These measures are by now very clear to all of us. From the data that we have been providing, it is evident that in Nairobi, Nairobi continues to be one of the epicenters with large numbers, largest numbers. So in Nairobi, it appears that the number of infections in Westlands, Kibra, Langata, Embakasi, and Dagoreti have been rising steadily. This situation should be of concern to all of us, and particularly to the residents of these areas. This requires serious soul searching by residents of these estates on what it is that they are not doing right and that enables the virus to spread in those communities. Could it be that containment measures are not being adhered to? Very, very likely. Something is not right, and they must move with speed to rectify this before things spiral out of control. We have said repeatedly that there is so much that the government can do in protecting Kenyans, and we will continue to do all that government can do to protect Kenyans. But there is also a responsibility on the part of each and every one of us to protect ourselves and to protect others, other Kenyans. So when we begin to see this type of spread, I think it is time to seriously reflect again and see what is it that we are not doing right? What should we, should we go back to in order to contain the spread of the virus? We have seen that in the past several weeks, people have become lax in terms of observing the measures that we have put out there. The wearing of masks, people congregating together, people going about their businesses as though life is normal as it used to be. It is not. We have a hidden enemy that is lurking in our midst and we must be on guard. So again, once more, we are appealing, and appealing very strongly to all Kenyans that we are at a stage where we need to be very vigilant, we need to observe the measures that have been put in place, and we need to follow very strictly those containment measures. Equally, the spread of the virus is also at our border points, particularly the border points at Malaba, Busia, Taveta and Namanga, and this is a matter that remains of great concern to us. Most of these positives that we pick up at these border points 
turn out to be truck drivers who are traversing through the country on our travel corridors. And the concern is that infected persons traveling through the country pose a serious risk of spread of the virus. I want to emphasize and to remind truck drivers and truck owners that all truck drivers must get tested at the point of origin at least 48 hours before the commencement of the journey. This requirement has been put in place so that we can ensure that the, 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 the journey of these drivers as they carry their cargo across these corridors and across borders is unhindered and that they do not get held up at the border point and create, create the snarl-ups that we are witnessing right now. And it's important, therefore, that they must wait to receive these results before embarking on their journey if one tests negative. We are taking additional measures also to provide testing services that will cut down on the turnaround time of results at those border points. We are in discussions on how we can build some level of capacity at those points so that we can ease this congestion that is happening at the border points. But I think the most important thing is to follow the, the, the guidelines provided by the ministry, which is 48 hours, t testing 48 hours before the journey begins. I want to appeal to all cross-border truck operators to abide by the protocols on the ministry's website. Employers are encouraged to advise their staff and general public accessing their workplaces to adhere to the laid down containment measures, which by now are very familiar to all of us. We we'll continue to repeat it, hand washing, keeping physical and social distance, observing cuff etiquette, avoiding face touching, proper use of face mask, avoiding gatherings, and staying at home as much as possible if one can do that. Turning to our COVID situation today, we have recorded the highest number of positive cases since the pandemic struck in our country. I say that with uh, some level of qualification because today we have tested a sample of 6,024. And among these samples, we have found 213 positive cases. The qualification I refer to is that you can note that the 6,000 is a large number. I think it's probably the largest one-time number that we have tested. And the positives, 213, also looks high. It's the highest we have recorded, actually. But we must also look at this in the context of the number of samples that we have tested. So if you look at it as a ratio, we have been testing approximately 2,000, roughly 2,000 samples a day. And this is what has taken us to the three-digit figures of 100 and just above 100. If you look at it in that relationship, this number is not that alarming because it still translates to about that level we are seeing of about 70 positive tests for every 2,000 tests tested. The reason why the number is huge that we have tested is because if you will recall, we have told you before that we had had some backlog of samples uh, which came up because we didn't have the reagents. We now have the reagents and we have been able to clear up this backlog, some part of this backlog, which accounts for the large number of samples tested and gives us those number of positives. This now brings to 4,257 the number of positive cases in the country. And the cumulative number of tests that we have carried out so far is 130,498. Out of the positive cases, 198 are 
are Kenyans, 15 are foreigners, and in terms of age, uh, in terms of gender, 151 are males, 62 are females. In terms of age, the youngest is one year old, the oldest is 73. By distribution in the counties, Nairobi, as I alluded to earlier, leads with 136 cases, followed by Mombasa with 32, Kajiado 13, Kiambu 7, Busia 5, Nakuru 4, Machakos 4, Garissa 3, Isiolo 3, Taita Taveta 2, Kitui, Migori, Narok, and Embu have one case each. The distribution of the new cases by sub-counties is as follows. The 136 cases in Nairobi come from Dagoreti North, 36, Westlands, 25, Kamkunji 17, Kibra 13, Makadara 11, Starehe 8, Langata 9, Kasarani 6, Mbakasi East 4, Mbakasi North 3, Ruaraka 3, and Mbakasi Central 1. Second leading county is Mombasa, and the cases today come from Mvita, 20 cases, Likoni and Kisauni, five cases each. Changamwe, two. In Kajiado, the 13 cases are from Kajiado Central, seven. Kajiado North, five. And Kajiado West, one. In Kiambu, the seven cases are from Ruiru, four. Kiambu Town, two. And Lari, one. In Busia, the five cases are from Teso North, three, and Teso South, two. The Nakuru cases are from Naivasha, two, and Gilgil, one. Machakos cases are in Ati River, two cases, and Machakos Town, two cases. In Garissa, the cases are from Dadab, two, and Garissa Township, one. In Isiolo, the three cases are from Isiolo town. The two cases in Taita Taveta are from Voi. The one case in Kitui from Kitui South. The one case in Migori from Suna East. And the one case from Narok is from Narok North. And the one case from Embu is from Manyata. On a positive note, we have today discharged 106 patients from our various hospitals, bringing the total cumulative number of recoveries to 1,459. We continue to appreciate the good work that our healthcare workers are doing out there. At the same time, regrettably, we report that we have lost 10 more patients to the disease. This is the highest number of fatalities recorded on a single day since the first case. And this brings to 117 the number of those who have succumbed to the disease. I want to send my heartfelt condolences to the families and friends of the departed. I will end my presentation there and I want to take this opportunity to Welcome uh, uh, P.S. Caberia from the Ministry of Petroleum and Mining. Uh, he's joining us today with a team. And uh, I think they have a few things to tell us about uh, what is happening in their space in terms of COVID-19. And also, I think we have uh, a donation that is being made through, through the ministry. So let me invite uh, P.S. Caberia to make his remarks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kaz Daktari, and uh, to the members of the press, thank you also for the time. Uh, may I join you also in uh, really imploring onto our people the importance of adhering to these uh, guidelines. As you can see, the situation is getting tougher, but we must continue getting tougher with it. At this time, we are here 
to celebrate the spirit of giving, the assistance from our corporate world, especially those within the mining sector, where we are saying, come out, come out and give more. Many people have given in the past. We say, well, don't give up, continue giving, continue donating. This fight is a fight for all of us. We must join in and make sure that we safeguard our country. The most important thing is awareness, and that awareness can only be attained if we all come together, and especially through you, the people in the fourth estate. Uh, Cass, I think mine will be very brief, except I will say that today we are here with a group of the corporate world that has decided to come and uh, join in the effort to try and fight uh, COVID-19. And we have uh, people from our sector in the, uh, that is based titanium from Kuala that has come in with a, a big donation. And I would like to give them a chance. Uh, I will ask Melba Wasuna from uh, uh, based titanium to come and at least share this with us. But again, I would like to say, as they have done today, let us continue doing this. To those other corporates that gave in the past, we know this, the need is growing. So if we approach you again and you have to give, kindly give, and anyone else out there who is able to give, give. So uh, Melba Wasuna, please come. Asante Sana, um, Bwana CAS, Ministry of Health. Thank you. Uh, Bwana PS, um, Ministry of Petroleum and Mining, State Department for Mining. Distinguished guests, my fellow Kenyans, Hamjambo. I'm very honored to be here today on behalf of Base Titanium, together to offer support and contribute to the government's COVID-19 mitigation um, actions. This COVID-19 pandemic is unique. Um, it's quite a unique challenge and one that requires a collective response. So it's very encouraging that we see here multiple private sector actors. We've got here a colleague from Stanbic um, as well, and working together very closely with government to deliver solutions and support. When Bay Titanium was first approached about contributing to Stanbic Bank's uh, ventilator initiative, we were immediately interested. It resonated with many of our core values, notably how activities can have a long-term sustainable impact on Kenya's growth and prosperity. Today, Base Titanium is proud to be contributing 100 high-flow nasal cannula oxygen therapy devices, i.e. ventilators, um, that will save lives during the current COVID-19 pandemic and will be a lasting legacy for hospitals around the country for years to come. This donation forms the major component of our national level contribution to fighting COVID-19. We are also working very closely with the Ministry of Petroleum and Mining through Principal Secretary Ambassador Caberia to provide PPEs, infrared thermometers and other support. In addition to the ventilators, today, Base Titanium is also donating COVID-19 diagnostic kits that are capable of conducting over 1,300 tests. The kids will contribute to the government's efforts to manage the virus through a rigorous testing regime. Our contributions are driven by the belief in the need for government and the private sector to work together in these extraordinary times. They also tie in very well with our health programs in Kuala, where we've been implementing in partnership with the Kuala County for several years and align very closely with, President's, with the President's Big Four agenda for ensuring access to quality healthcare for all Kenyans. I'd like to, to extend my sincere appreciation to the Ministry of Petroleum and Mining, in particular, the State Department of Mining, for being our partners in the development of Kenya's mining sector. Our strategic partnership with the Kuala County government continues to deepen, especially in the areas of poverty alleviation and assistance to the most vulnerable in these COVID-19 times. And of course, we must all commend Stan Big Bank and the Ministry of Health for spearheading the initiative to source these ventilators in the first place. As I conclude, His Excellency the President has repeatedly stated that we are at war with an invisible enemy, and we can win the war if we work together and make collective efforts. Base Titanium is proud to be a partner in this fight, 
and we'll continue to look for further opportunities to support response efforts. Asante Nisana. Uh, thank you very much, Melba. Now you know this kind of effort is uh, actually spearheaded, put together by uh, Stanbic. In that regard, allow me to just invite the CEO of Stanbic, Charles, to also come and say a word, and uh, then we'll go back to Cass and we'll take questions. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues, and good afternoon. Thank you very much for giving us this time to share this uh, platform and to be able to talk about our efforts in addressing the challenge that, f that faces us all. Um, Stanwick Bank partnered with a number of corporates in response to the government request and call for the private sector to come and assist in the fight for our invisible enemy, the COVID-19. We partnered with um, a couple of corporates, our best titanium being one of them, uh, Vala, uh, Centum, Gulf Oil, and Africa Practice to put together a consortium that brought into the country 192 um, high-flow nasal cannula devices, commonly called ventilators. We realized there was an urgent need for these ventilators in the country because for all our sick patients, well, they need help in breathing and they need that support from the private sector. It is our own and privilege, therefore, to announce that those ventilators have arrived and the contribution that we're making towards helping our health sector and indeed the patients that are suffering from this disease, that they can be able to be helped. In addition to supporting the nation through the ventilators, Stanbig is also contributing 1,000 protective suits, 500 gloves, and 5,000 masks, which will be donated through the Kenya Health Federation. Those are already being sourced locally because we also want to support our local industry and support our local entrepreneurs so that they can also be able to continue producing and continue being in business. We are also have partnered with the Rotary International to contribute 700 water tanks which are being used across the country, 400 which have been distributed in Nairobi for people to wash their hands and to sanitize because as we know, the only vaccine we have for COVID-19 is social hygiene, washing our hands, sanitizing, and social distance. To this end, Stanbig is proud to be associated with the private sector to continue to partner with the government to ensure that we can successfully fight this pandemic that we're facing and that we can all win at the end of the day. So we want to thank our partners, as I've indicated, based Titanium we've worked with, Vala, Centum, Gulf Oil, and Africa Practice We've come together to help work with us to be able to make this contribution possible and to support the nation's effort in fighting this disease. I want to thank you very much and thank you, Minister of Health, for allowing us this opportunity to partner with yourselves to achieve this result. Okay. Uh, let me take this opportunity to, to thank uh, uh, the team here that has made the donation today. Uh, and generally thank all those well-wishers who have been supporting the efforts of the ministry and in general the COVID-19 response, which is multi-sectoral. We have had a great outpouring of uh, uh, interest to donate, both from the private sector as well as from uh, our partners, development partners, uh, and, and many other well-wishers. Uh, I think it's very commendable. We want to encourage you to continue to, with that spirit of supporting the government's response. This pandemic that we are in is going to test us. It is going to stretch our resources, and we're going to need all the support that we can all muster in any form to be able to uh, combat this pandemic. It's going to be drawn out too. So uh, as the team was approaching here, I told them I was going to challenge them. And my challenge is that this is only a first donation. We're expecting to see more donations as time moves on. You understand the, uh, uh, the PPEs and, uh, uh, that we use in this uh, pandemic. These are one-time use disposable items that are very expensive. They need to be replaced all the time. Uh, I mentioned... Uh, 
our testing program and some of the challenges that we face in testing, particularly in terms of the flow and supply chain of the testing kits. Those are areas that I think we're going to continuously need some level of support from all those who are, are ready to do that. Uh, and as we do that, I would also like to, to tell uh, those who want to support us that so that that donation you're going to make is, uh, is going to be useful and make some impact, especially in those areas where some of these items that are being donated are of a technical nature. It would be important to liaise with the ministry ahead of time so that you can get an idea, uh, uh, you can be given the specifications or the sources uh, of the items that we use. In testing, for example, there are certain test kits that we use, uh, machines that take certain test kits. We could always direct you to what type of, uh, of, of materials that you can uh, put your money in as a donation to the response. Um, I think I will now ask uh, Colonel Oguna maybe to take the questions, a few questions which we'll try to respond to. Oh, thank you. Hi, my name is Winnie from Ibru TV. Two questions. One, you talked about an increase in the numbers and especially in Nairobi. So with the easing of the restrictions for COVID-19 restrictions, do you think that this will accelerate the numbers even more? And then have you intensified on the release of asymptomatic patients um, to go back home to create room for the new inf uh, patients who are coming in? And while on the same for Dr. Amoth, there's a concern about the asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic patients, where some patients are believed to be asymptomatic and yet they are pre-symptomatic. So how, what, are, what are some of the ways that you're doing to identify whether one is pre-symptomatic or the other is asymptomatic? And then the second question is, what is the state or update on the 300 bed capacity um, isolation facilities in the counties? Have they been set up yet or not? Thanks. Helen Aura from NTV. You mentioned uh, out of the three cases in Garissa, two are from Dadaab, if I'm not wrong. What does this mean? Because Dadaab is a refugee, has, hosts a refugee camp. So what does this mean in terms of preparedness, in terms of now, ref, when it comes to refugees, not only even in Dadaab, but also in Kakuma as well? My second question, Mandera has recorded, uh, or rather is still recording a flattening of the curve. Does this mean that you'll lift the restrictions imposed in the county? Nancy Okwara kutoka KBC. Swali langu la kwanza ni hapo jana ulitangaza kwamba kuna baadhi ya vifaa vya kupima a, virusi vya corona ambavyo viko katika soko la humu nchini lakini havitoi matokeo kama inavyostahili. Na swali langu ni je vifaa hivi viliwasili vipi katika soko la humu nchini na kama wizara mnaweza kutambua kule ambavyo vilitoka ili mchukue hatua zaidi. Na mwisho kabisa kuna wakati ambapo waziri Kagwe alitangaza kwamba uh, kulikuwa na idadi kubwa ya wagonjwa ambao wanafariki kutoka nyumbani katika kaunti ya Mombasa uh, na leo hii tumetangaza watu kumi ambao wamefariki kutokana na virusi vya corona. Je, mtindo huu bado unashuhudiwa ama watu wameanza kwenda hospitalini hivyo basi wale ambao wamefariki walikuwa katika vituo mbalimbali vya matibabu? Okay, okay. Thank you. Um, the first question was on uh, the increasing numbers that we are seeing, and, and, and uh, particularly here in Nairobi, and how does easing of the measures uh, impact upon, upon this? It's true we are seeing increasing numbers. As we said yesterday, this, the, 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 the spread of the infection generally follows a curve. Wherever it happens, it follows a curve. We may be at that point where we are rising on that curve. So we are going to see more cases as we move forward. Uh, but this is a fine balance between containment and uh, ensuring that people are actually able to uh, follow their, their, their livelihoods and uh, be able to live their lives. And that is why these measures uh, are at some point have to be eased to allow people to be able to go about and do their business and, and earn a living. It's a fine balance. 
And that felt balance is informed by many things. It's informed by the epidemiology of the disease as we see, the, the, the curve, the way it is rising, uh, the ability for us to be able to respond, the strength of our and capacity of our health systems. All of these are taken into consideration. And if you will recall, when the president was uh, making those uh, announcements about easing these measures about two weeks ago or so, uh, these considerations are taken into place, including some modeling uh, data that uh, informs us. We feel that uh, the easing of these measures, provided we continue to observe the containment measures, the infection prevention and control measures that we have repeatedly talked about, uh, we can still be able to continue flattening that curve so that our health systems do not get overwhelmed. The biggest concern is when these numbers rise so rapidly that your health systems become overwhelmed. Then you will find that people will begin to die because one, they cannot get into a facility, they will begin to die at home and other places. The idea of flattening the curve is to make sure that that doesn't happen, that when people get sick, those who need hospitalization, they are able to get those services. And that is what informed our strategy, change in strategy of looking carefully at uh, asymptomatic cases, the level of risk they present, and the possibility of uh, taking, uh, you know, providing home-based care for them. The idea there is because a large number of our positives tend to be in that category of asymptomatic where they could be taken care of under the right conditions in a home setting. That would then allow us to be prepared for any surge that happens as these numbers rise and which we expect is likely to happen. And Dr. Amot will talk a little bit more, more about that. Uh, in terms of uh, the state of uh, the 300 bed capacity. Uh, you will recall that, uh, again, almost at that time when the president was uh, making that statement, following that, there was a meeting between the Council of Governors and uh, the executive uh, to ensure that this 300 bed capacity is met within a certain deadline. Uh, and in fact, resources have already been availed to this effect. There's a sum of about 5 billion Kenya shillings that you are all aware has been released to the counties as part of this COVID response. So I believe that is on, on track and we should be hearing about that from the National Emergency Response uh, Committee anytime soon. The two cases in Garissa, uh, in the refugee camp, it's not the first time we have picked uh, positives from uh, Dadaab, especially Dadaab refugee camp. And uh, there is capacity to be able to deal with, with cases if there are cases that need attention in Dadaab. Uh, there are actually some very good uh, hospital within, within the, the refugee camp that has been uh, beefed up to be able to deal with this. So, yes, I know that when you get cases in, in situations such as a refugee camp or in a, in a, in a incarceration facility and so on, it raises concern because of the congestion and conditions in such places. Uh, as best as we can, we have taken the necessary action to ensure that one, we try to minimize that happening. Two, if it does happen, we have, we have, we have put in place measures that will be able to isolate those and prevent the risk of transmission within those environments. About lifting the restricted movement in Mandera County, now that we are seeing the numbers are not, are not rising and might even be coming down, I think that is a decision that will be made by the National Emergency Response Committee. Uh, I know that they, they should be meeting soon and perhaps there may be some, some, some further addresses that need to be made on, uh, on that. Let's wait for that and see what happens there. 
KBC uh, talked on the, the rapid diagnostic tests that I spoke about yesterday. I think that's a very pertinent question that was asked. Why is it that, uh, how did these rapid tests enter the market? Remember I said that these rapid tests can play a role. They have a function that they can perform. Our concern is that if they are not used for that function but are used for another function, then that is not right. To use rapid diagnostic tests to claim that they test coronavirus, they are, they are, they are a test for coronavirus is incorrect for now because that's not what is used. These RDTs can be used for zero uh, epidemiological uh, testing to determine whether one has been exposed, whether one has antibodies. And in that sense, uh, they, can, they can enter the market for that purpose. So our concern is that they are not used for a purpose that the ministry has not approved them for. There is a process. Uh, there is a lot of uh, information uh, that is still lacking in terms of the use of RDTs. When that information becomes available, if that information points to a fact that RDTs might be able to give an indication of diagnosis, then that determination will be made. In the meantime, RDTs cannot be used as a test to diagnose COVID-19. And that's, that's, I think that's the message that we want to send out there. Home deaths in Mombasa, which had increased. Uh, again, I think Dr. Amoth will talk about that. But uh, of course we will expect some home deaths to continue to happen because those home deaths that happen actually are people who are vulnerable to the virus. You know that there are categories of people if you are beyond uh, 60 and your immune systems are low. If on top of that you have another existing condition or a comorbidity, then you become vulnerable and could easily get infected and even be killed by this virus. Therefore, home deaths will occur because there may be such individuals who will pick a virus from maybe a family member or somebody visiting uh, the home or somebody they've interacted with. And, 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 and this person then might very rapidly deteriorate without knowing that is actually the COVID virus that finally will, will kill the person. So we will expect to see some of these home-based home, home, home deaths as we move forward. But we also want to ensure that those who are infected are identified very quickly and are be, uh, taken into isolation and treatment facilities so that they can take, get the appropriate care. Let me hand over to Dr. Amoth, perhaps, to respond to one or two of those questions. Thank you, CS, Dr. Rashid, uh, PS, uh, Ambassador Kabiria. Uh, let me start from the last one on home-based deaths or community deaths. Out of the 10 mortalities you have reported today is only one that is a community or home-based death. And let me restate again that we are usually very concerned about home Based deaths because usually people who die at home means they are uh, most likely symptomatic and they are shedding the virus in huge quantities. And in the spirit of Africans, as we care for the sick, uh, then that puts uh, the immediate members of the household at risk of transmission of disease. Uh, I want to report here gladly that the home deaths that we initially reported from Mombasa have since ceased. I want to thank Mombasa County through the leadership of Ex Excellency Governor Joe and his team for a job well done. Uh, we'll still be on the lookout for home-based deaths wherever they occur so that we can be able to offer support to ensure that we change our health seeking behavior so that people can be able to seek health services in health facilities. Uh, let me also further add something about the DAB. And all the other refugee camps, of course, these were areas that we picked as potential hotspots because, you know, our refugee camps are domiciled mostly in the eastern part of the country. And we have a porous border with our neighbor, Somali. And because of the nature of the movement there, this area was picked as a potential high spot, hotspot 
and the cases that you have received from there uh, testify to that effect. What you have done, of course, to ensure that you have capacity building, we ensure that we have enough protective gear. Uh, we have supported Garissa County with enough protective gear, capacity building, and of course, the issues of inf infection prevention and control. Further working through a multi-agency team, that is a security apparatus, Department of Immigration, the public health uh, uh, officials, and the Nyumbakumi initiative to ensure that anybody who moves in can quickly be identified and quarantined appropriately. Regarding asymptomatic and uh, presymptomatic, very good scientific approach. Asymptomatic means you are tested positive for COVID-19, but throughout the span of the disease, you don't develop any symptoms. While presymptomatic simply means that you test positive for COVID-19, but over the period of the disease, then you develop the symptoms. Yesterday, I clearly articulated to you people here that 88% of our people are asymptomatic. They de don't develop any symptoms throughout the span of the disease. So it's only the 12% who either have symptoms or who are presymptomatic. Initially, they don't have symptoms, but over the course of the disease, they develop one symptom or the other, like fever, difficulty in breathing, cough, loss of taste, or loss of sense of smell. It is with this view in, uh, in mind that uh, based on the WHO guidelines on home-based care, we further refined our home-based care through the support of our uh, case management team. And this criteria is a very strict criteria that requires, one, that you must have a positive COVID-19 test. Number two, you must be asymptomatic. So the moment you have any symptom, then you, can, you don't qualify for home-based care. Or if you are in home-based care and you develop any symptom during the period you are in home-based care, then automatically we transfer you to an isolation and, or a treatment center. This is to be able to safeguard the members of the household and the community at large. And we are now uploading the module on, on home-based care for the community health volunteers and other healthcare workers to ensure that we sensitize the more than 60,000 community health volunteers and more than 30,000 healthcare workers to ensure that these instructions and guidelines and protocols are followed to the letter not only to be able to relieve the burden of uh, our healthcare system being overwhelmed, but also to bring services closer to the people. And as we stated previously, we have done this successfully before with other conditions, including HIV AIDS. So we will not leave anything to chance. We'll apply a very strict criteria. We'll have a serious monitoring tool, and we'll, ha we'll have to get reports every week to ensure that the guidelines and protocols work as proposed. Thank you. My name is Sam Gitoko from Citizen TV. A few questions here. And first on the 10 deaths that you're reporting, it would appear that they do not come from any of the cases that was in ICU as of uh, reports yesterday. So I want to know the circumstances in which these people died, is it because that those facilities that were admitted that were not offering the required care, or I mean, what exactly happened? Then number two, you said that out of the 6,000 um, samples that have been tested, it is from the backlog. Uh, what proportion of this is from the backlog that you had? And out of the 213 uh, positive cases, which one would you attribute to the backlog? And that, does this pose a risk, especially to people that may have been moving around while being positive with, with no knowledge? And then finally, are there any studies that are being conducted to establish the chains of transmission, especially in areas in Nairobi, talking about the Goretti North, talking about Westlands, any chains of transmission that will tell where these particular positive cases are and how they are being spread? My name is Emmanuel Top from KTA News. Uh, just a few questions. One, we've recorded the highest number of deaths today how many, and I'm looking for numbers for this question, how many of those uh, did not have any, any underlying conditions? And uh, for those who had the underlying conditions, what were the conditions and how many, how many were they? And then number two, 
we've recorded 200 cases, over 200 cases today. Are we approaching the peak yet, or are we on the peak of these cases in the country? Thank you. My name is Graham Kajula from The Standard. My question is regards to, um, to what extent will you say that um, herd immunity has had a role in the way the disease spreads in the country, considering that the DG has said 88% uh, of the cases that we have are asymptomatic and we're not recording as many deaths as other, as other countries. My second question is uh, probably to the CS. Um, what will be your comment on some staff who have been transferred and have decided to go to court? from the Ministry of Health. Uh, the last one is on the issue of teenage pregnancies. There was some scare yesterday about the numbers, which uh, let us some counties clarified, but at the same time, uh, what initiative do you have in terms of uh, managing such incidences, considering that uh, children are not going to school at the moment? Okay. Thank you. Sam Getuko, uh, you need some details on the 10 deaths that we have reported today, and I think even uh, the gentleman from uh, KTN News also asked about that. Uh, in terms of breakdown of these 10 deaths, where did they occur? Uh, what facilities? Uh, and uh, what proportion of these deaths are from uh, people who may have had some underlying conditions and what type of conditions uh, those are? Uh, I think that is a question for the technical team here to answer if they have that information on hand. We may not have that information here on hand right now, but uh, I think Dr. Amot says he could respond to that. This requires looking at the statistics and breaking it down. So I'll leave it to Dr. Amot to respond to that question. But you also talked about chain of transmission and what are we doing in terms of uh, chain of transmission. The rapid response teams their day-to-day -day work is actually to do the contact tracing uh, and to go after every possible contact once a COVID uh, positive case is determined. They develop very elaborate uh, transmission maps that follow the number of people uh, that a case may have had contact with. They then uh, test those contacts as well. And if they find positives within those contacts, it creates another chain that needs to be followed up. So it's an elaborate process. And in fact, it is one of the pillars really of uh, uh, containing any pandemic. This is what is meant by the identify uh, or trace and treat uh, uh, philosophy that is used in, in uh, trying to uh, curtail a pandemic. So we do that, that information is available. The rapid response team uh, have all those details and if there's any particular map that may be desired, I think it can be provided for any particular individual. Uh, we, we do have those maps. KTN News, I think I have lumped your question together with uh, Gituku's question to be answered by Dr. Amot. Uh, standard, when we talk about herd immunity, uh, indeed, it's a natural thing that happens as, as a population is exposed to a particular pathogen over a certain period of time when a number of people have been uh, infected by, uh, have been exposed to this pathogen, and the body's normal responses have mounted uh, uh, an antibody or an immune response. It's not only antibody, there's also cell-mediated immunity. Uh, then you may develop a level of what you may call then herd immunity. If you recall when uh, this virus was beginning to spread in the UK, for instance. The argument there was that, uh, well, let's just leave this virus and see how it spreads in the hope that herd immunity uh, would come in and uh, curtail the spread of the virus. We know that that didn't happen and the UK had to change their strategy and it's not only UK. I think there are other countries that, uh, was it Sweden, I believe, uh, that used that approach. Uh, but very soon they found that the, the spread was just too fast in, uh, for them to, to be able to, to take that position and they brought in these containment measures which we are using here. What we know is that this herd immunity as far as COVID-19 is concerned is still unknown. It's still unknown. 
We talked about the RDTs, for example, the rapid diagnostic tests, which I said pick up the antibody. Equally, when these tests first came out, in some countries they were being used as what is called certificate of immunity. In other words, if a person tested positive for, on an RDT test indicating that he had an antibody, it was assumed, therefore, that this person was immune to the virus and would not be reinfected, and he could then go back to work without any fear of transmitting the virus. That has never come to be proved because we do not yet have any idea whether those antibodies actually protect, whether immunity, the immunity that we see through detection of antibody actually means that an individual uh, will not be reinfected or will, uh, will, uh, will, will not be a risk factor in terms of uh, uh, transmission of the disease. So there's a lot of... Uh, uh, unknowns as far as COVID-19 is concerned. With some of the other viruses similar to COVID-19, over time, yes, herd immunity has been demonstrated and it becomes self-containing. We still don't know with COVID, and it's too dangerous to assume that. We have already indicated uh, two cases where they attempted that and found that they had to come back to it, to containment measures. So we'll continue with these containment measures. Over time, I'm sure that a lot of knowledge will be generated about immunity to COVID-19. The staff transferred. Uh, I have equally seen uh, in yesterday's paper uh, the issues surrounding this. I think the instructions have left the ministry, so we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see how that uh, develops, but uh, action has been taken to move those individuals, and we expect that those individuals will uh, heed those instructions and move to the pos to the stations that they have been posted to. I think that was it. So let me hand over. What to was the question about ATM? KTN was about uh, deaths, the, okay. the deaths, and how many were had underlying conditions, and what were they? Thank you, Waziri. Uh, again, let me start with the last. There was a question about teenage pregnancies, and I think escaped the boss' uh, attention. Yes, we got this report from Achakos, indicating that we have 4,000 teenagers who have become pregnant since the. Uh, onset of this pandemic. Remember, we had our first case in March, on the uh, 13th of March is when we officially declared the first COVID-19 case in Kenya. On average, mothers who come for antenatal services in healthcare facilities come in the third trimester, the last 12 or 13 weeks of the pregnancy. So if you go back to March, and now we are on the 18th of June, we are basically talking of the first or second early, uh, early second trimester. So it's very unlikely that even if these young girls fell pregnant, they have already gone to the facilities for somebody to verify that they are indeed pregnant. Huh? Uh, but that notwithstanding, our team at the Division of Reproductive Health are looking at this data, remember also in the Kenya Demographic Health Survey of 2019, 400,000 teenagers get pregnant every year. So one county reporting 4,000 would also not be far-fetched. But I think we leave it to the team at the Division of Reproductive Health to look at the data and uh, compare it with what we have in the District Health Information System. Then we shall be able to give you uh, an appropriate answer. In terms of the deaths, we reported 10 de deaths today. Nine of these deaths occurred in health facilities. Six at Kenyatta University, teaching referral and research hospital. Two occurred at the Coast General Hospital in Mombasa, and one in Nairobi Hospital. And of course, I told you about one community death in Kiambu. Uh, that tells you that our health-seeking behavior is changing. Many people are going to the facilities. And this is not an indictment on the treatment of these particular cases. Remember, there's no cure for COVID. 
the treatment is basically supportive. So if you come and you have respiratory failure or you have kidney failure, basically the role of the doctors and nurses and the laboratory people is to support you throughout that period and hope that you are able to pull through. I'm confident that uh, even though we lost this number of people, these deaths occurred in facility and they received the best care that we could be able to afford them. Uh, in terms of the proportion of the 6,000, what came from the backlog? Uh, we had a backlog of just about 5,000 uh, tests. So for today, maybe about 1,000, 1,500 could have come from the backlog. And I'm glad again to report that we have now since cleared the backlog of tests. There is always danger that if you have a backlog like that and somebody tests positive, after you have kept a specimen for three, four days or one week, and the person is moving around, of course, there's always that risk that he or she would be able to transmit the infection to other people. But what else could we be able to do? There was nothing because we didn't have the test kits to be able to confirm. What we pray and hope is that the global supply chain pipeline will get better and we'll have consistency in, in the test kits that we continue to get. There was an issue about uh, transmission and contact tracing. It is usually very, very difficult to be able to do contact tracing once you have established community transmission. So linking somebody with a contact becomes very difficult and it becomes very, very expensive and tedious and tiring for the healthcare workers. So then you shift your, your, your plan from doing contact tracing to basically trying to contain the spread of the infection. Uh, out of these 10, seven of them, out of the 10 mortalities reported today, seven of them had underlying medical conditions, with four having diabetes mellitus, one having hypertension, one had chronic myeloid leukemia or bone cancer, and one had HIV. And I think this is the second or third HIV COVID positive case that we are reporting. Studies from South Africa have indicated that those who are taking the ARVs appropriately are able to achieve viral suppression. So it is again our call to those who are on treatment to ensure that they adhere to the treatment. Our health facilities are available, open 24-7. Please go for your prescription refill. You, the, the healthcare workers are properly trained, they are properly geared, and they are safe. So don't fail to take your medicine because you fear getting COVID. Because if you get COVID-19 and you're not taking your medication, it's like you are sentencing yourself to death. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think there's only one more thing left for us, and that is the ceremony of handover, where we'll just walk over there and uh, receive the donation.